One of the favorite sayings of a young heroin addict is, the struggle is real. Over time, we learned that the statement wasn't just a saying, it was descriptive of her life experience. Drugs was not my problem, drugs was my solution. My problem was life. I always felt insecure. I was scared all the time. I had anxiety going on because I never knew what was going to happen next. A growing body of research is painting a clear picture that addiction is a complex issue. It's not just pleasure seeking gone wrong, it's not just a biological disease, and it's not just a reaction to a painful childhood. Addiction is a result of a complex interaction of many contributing factors which, by definition, leads a person to repetitively engaging in certain behaviors to feel normal. The change in what is perceived as normal has its basis in how the brain works. Normalcy is formed in the brain's limbic system. This is that part of the brain that allows us to learn what behaviors we want to repeat and those which we want to avoid. The limbic system is composed of many inner working parts including the hippocampus, which helps us form memories and learn, the amygdala, which attributes emotional evaluation to everything, and the striatum, where habitual automated behavior is developed. These inner working parts form the brain's reinforcement system. Herein, the brain allows us to experience, identify, and reinforce certain behaviors that are good for us, like eating and exercising. The behavior that is to be reinforced, or something linked to that behavior, activates cells in the ventral tegma area, or VTA. This sets off a chain reaction within the limbic system. Long projections of VTA cells go to an area called the ventral striatum, or VS. The chain of activated cells quickly reaches an area in the VS called the nucleus accumbens. This is the part of the brain that says, wahoo, do that again. How the limbic system contributes to repetitive, addictive behavior requires a little background. When brain cells are activated, they generate an electric signal. This signal causes cells to release certain molecules called neurotransmitters. These are very specific chemical messengers. The chemical messengers are then received by another cell. This is how brain cells communicate with one another. There are many different types of neurotransmitters which serve multiple functions. The small gap between cells is called the synapse. The cell sending the message is called presynaptic, and the cell receiving the message is the postsynaptic cell. The electrical signal in the presynaptic cell causes packets, or vesicles, which store neurotransmitters to migrate to the end of the cell, merge with it, open up and release the neurotransmitters into the synapse. In the limbic system, there are many brain cells designed to release the neurotransmitter dopamine. The dopamine molecules drift across the synapse and link up with protein molecules called dopamine receptors on the surface of the postsynaptic cell. Part of the receptor is on the outside of the receiving cell and part is on the inside. When the dopamine binds with the receptor's exterior part, like a key into a lock, it triggers a cascade of events inside the receiving cell. Other proteins attached to the interior part of the receptor carry the signal onward to the interior of the cell. When there is an excess of dopamine, or when the receptor releases the attached transmitter, they are free in the synapse again. Some of this dopamine re-enters the presynaptic cell through a special protein called a dopamine transporter. Once back inside the presynaptic cell, they are again available for release. In a healthy brain, there are always moderate amounts of dopamine in the synaptic space. However, when a behavior that the brain wants to repeat is happening, such as eating a delicious meal, the presynaptic cell releases a larger amount of dopamine in a sudden burst. Dopamine transporters will then quickly remove the excess, returning the amount of dopamine to the original level. This healthy dopamine cycle helps the brain to learn about, adapt to, and navigate a complex world. Normal cycling of dopamine release occurs in the VS, activating the entire stratum and limbic areas. Activation of the limbic system has far-reaching effects throughout the brain. From the VS, the limbic system activation extends into the prefrontal cortex, or PFS. This is that part of the brain that allows us to think, plan, solve problems, and make decisions. It is the area most frequently targeted by cognitive function development activities. When properly activated and strengthened, the PFS modulates our emotional response, regulates the limbic system drives, and allows us to put the emotions, which the limbic system assigns to everything, into useful and meaningful context. 
All substance abuse and some highly stimulating behaviors such as sex and gambling stimulate or modify the dopamine cycle. When someone first uses cocaine, for example, the drug quickly enters the brain where it blocks the transporters on the presynaptic cell. Since the dopamine now cannot re-enter the presynaptic cell, it begins to accumulate in the synapse where it can reach abnormally high levels and remain there much longer than usual. This causes the postsynaptic cell to become hyperactivated, creating an incredibly powerful association between the euphoric experience and the behavior which introduced it. The result is a limbic drive to repeat the experience, which, if not modulated by the prefrontal cortex, will lead to further drug-seeking behavior. Again, when someone uses methamphetamine, the drug quickly enters the brain. At first, the drug blocks the re-entry of dopamine into the presynaptic cell. As the meth accumulates, though, it stimulates the release of more dopamine into the synapse, which then cannot be reabsorbed, leading to a significant oversupply of dopamine in the synapse. This causes the postsynaptic cell to be activated to dangerously high levels. One of the incredible features of the human brain is that it always seeks to find a way to normalize its ongoing experience. Thus, if you grow up in Minnesota, frigid winters become a normal experience and you probably find a way to actually have fun in the snow. Likewise, if you're exposed to adverse conditions for long enough, such as poverty or war or abuse, the adverse conditions become normalized, allowing you to survive and even thrive in the adversity. However, should the adverse conditions suddenly be removed, the person may struggle to adjust to the new favorable conditions. And when the limbic system is repeatedly overstimulated by the use of substances or addictive behavior, the brain will adjust to a new normal where the presence of the substance or the behavior is expected or even needed. When this occurs, the person must habitually take the substance or engage in the behavior to maintain the new state of normal. At this point, taking the substance or engaging in that behavior is less about the euphoria it once produced and more about avoiding the anxiety, fear, and pain that comes from falling into what is now an abnormal condition, that is, being apart from the substance or the dopamine stimulating behavior. Research shows that continuing to use the substance or to engage in the addictive behavior actually changes the pathways and structure of the brain. Specifically, in a healthy brain, the prefrontal cortex regulates and modulates the limbic system's function of applying emotion to everything. It provides a reason, context, and meaning to what we feel. In a brain adjusted to a new normal of substance use and impulsive behavior, the prefrontal cortex is reprogrammed by the dopamine overload. Thus, rather than applying thoughtful control over the limbic system, the PFC hijacked by the new normal condition will look for ways to satisfy the cravings, justify the impulsiveness, and dismiss or minimize any negative consequences. Cognitive function development therapy directly stimulates and strengthens the prefrontal cortex, allowing it to regain its position of controlling and modulating the limbic system. Cognitive function development increases the person's working memory capacity, allowing for more information to be held and evaluated in the mind for improved consideration of potential consequences and regulation of impulses. In addition, cognitive function development therapy harnesses the brain's inherent neuroplasticity, that is, its ability to change and establish to a new normal. As a result, cognitive function development therapy can improve an individual's fluid intelligence, increase attention and focus, and strengthen overall logic and reason. These far-reaching effects provide positive, lasting, and life-changing results in the person's life, relationships, job prospects, and academic performance. If you'd like to know more about cognitive function development therapy, visit us on the web at www.transformedtraining.org. Thank you for watching.